Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Siegel. I'm joined by my colleague, Sean Maurer, today. Uh, today's workshop will be approximately an hour and a half. Uh, and for those of you who may have questions or, or uh, would like to use the, the chat function as well, those controls should be located towards the bottom of your screen. Uh, so if you do have any questions, feel free to go ahead and use the uh, Q&A function. Uh, we will do a, a few polls today, so just so you're aware and are prepared for that. Uh, so today, wanting to make sure that we're uh, understanding some of the uh, differences between the International Energy Conservation Code and ASHRAE 90.1, uh, which is a standard and particularly focusing on the envelope uh, for that. Uh, so, also looking at some of the prescriptive uh, requirements uh, along with existing buildings and how those differ between the IECC and ASHRAE 90.1. So, as far as uh, looking at a continuing education credits, uh, everyone who participates today uh, will be uh, provided a certificate of participation uh, for those of you who uh, self-report CEUs. Uh, for those of you who may need ICC or AIA credits uh, in that email that goes out with that uh, participation certificate, uh, there will be a, a link that you can use uh, to provide us your ICC and AIA uh, information, and we will go ahead and, and get that uh, filed for you as well. Uh, so, but everyone today uh, will receive their certificate of participation. Uh, that generally is is within about a week that you would see that. So, a little bit of background as far as who we are. Uh, we are part of the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center, also known as CDAC, and we are an applied research program housed at the University of Illinois uh, at the uh, Urbana-Champaign campus, and our primary mission is to reduce the energy footprint uh, of Illinois and beyond, and so these energy code trainings uh, and uh, support for the Illinois Energy Code is one of the ways that we provide uh, that mission. So uh, we do like to uh, note that today's program is sponsored by the State of Energy Office located at the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, so we do like to uh, thank them for their support of the Illinois Energy Code uh, training program. Uh, so with that, we do have several aspects to that training program, which includes our technical support helpline. So if you do have questions uh, regarding, you know, if the energy code applies, how does it apply? How do I uh, meet compliance with the energy code? Uh, you know, are there uh, certain aspects that we might look at to uh, go above and beyond the minimum code standards? Uh, we do have a technical support line for your use, energy code at illinois.edu. Uh, we do have an 800 number if you do have just a, a real brief question. Uh, but we do prefer, uh, prefer receiving questions uh, via our email address, uh, provides us the opportunity to provide you uh, a written response uh, that can be used uh, for assistance in your uh, project, not only for you, uh, but others that may be involved in your, pro uh, your project, such as the contractors, uh, code officials and, and the like, so that you have some good supporting documentation uh, of the, the positions. So we also have multiple online resources housed at our website, uh, smartenergy.illinois.edu slash energy dash code. Uh, some of those include uh, upcoming workshops and webinars along with archive versions of our uh, previous workshops and webinars, uh, such as the one that is being recorded today. Uh, so after today's uh, workshop, uh, an archive version will be made available on our website. So uh, if you want to go back and review something that you may have missed, uh, or uh, potentially if you have a, a colleague or uh, 
someone who was not able to make it today, uh, you can go ahead and, and share that link back to them. So we also have multiple online courses and this uh, course curriculum is uh, growing over time. And these are uh, self-paced online courses that take approximately an hour to an hour and a half uh, to complete uh, these courses. Uh, they are uh, available for CEUs. So for those of you who may be uh, needing some continuing education uh, later on, uh, this is available for you. Also provides links back to our technical support line. So again, if you can't quite remember uh, energy code at illinois.edu, uh, you can come over to our website and find our technical support uh, line. Along with that are several uh, resources, including information about what the uh, Illinois Energy Code uh, is, along with links to frequently asked questions. Uh, we get a, a lot of different questions uh, through our helpline, uh, and a lot of those seem to revolve around roofing. Uh, so if you do have a, a question that you think, you know, I, I bet someone else has uh, asked this a, a couple of different times, uh, check those frequently asked questions. Uh, along with links to several useful websites. Uh, again, understanding that if you find our website, that may be a little bit easier of a link to remember than trying to access the uh, International Energy Conservation Code directly, uh, or in particular, the Illinois amendments to the uh, International Energy Conservation Code, uh, rather than trying to remember these long strings of uh, web addresses, you can come to our website and, and find direct links over to the ICC website, uh, the Capital Development Board, uh, and the like. So with these, uh, we'll note that the 2021 IECC has al also been published. Uh, they are now already on their second printing uh, of that. So we do have links provided here to the 2018 and the upcoming 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, uh, the present Illinois amendments, uh, along with uh, a link over to the Chicago Energy Conservation Code for those of you who may be doing work within the city of Chicago. So uh, the International Code Council does make their uh, codes viewable at no charge to folks. Uh, and we do like to call out that they do have very good uh, search function and feature uh, in their codes. Along with that, ASHRAE also uh, provides free access to their uh, standards. Uh, at the, the website here, uh, understanding that presently the uh, 2016 version of ASHRAE 90.1 uh, is the referenced standard of the current Illinois Energy Conservation Code, uh, whereas the 2019 version is now available uh, and will be the referenced standard in the upcoming 2021 IECC. So uh, if you go to the ASHRAE website and you search for 90.1, uh, the first one you're likely to come to is going to be the 2019 version, uh, which is further up the page. And then further down the page, uh, you will find the 2016 version. Uh, so again, if you go to their website and search 90.1, uh, the first one you'll probably end up at 2019, and the second one will probably be your 2016 version. So today's session is part of a series of uh, workshops. Uh, today is we're going to be focusing on the envelope and some of the differences between uh, ASHRAE standard 90.1 2019 version and the 2018 version of the International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, next month we're going to be looking at the mechanical provisions. Uh, April we'll look at lighting and electrical and then May we'll be looking at the performance-based compliance. Uh, for our workshops coming up. So uh, links to our upcoming workshops and webinars, again, available at our uh, website. So first thing that we want to cover 
is looking at uh, understanding that the IECC and the ASHRAE 90.1 are two paths that you can sh take to demonstrate compliance. Uh, you may demonstrate compliance uh, using uh, the 2018 IECC or using the 2016 version of ASHRAE 90.1. So uh, you can choose either path. Uh, you, you cannot use a mixture of those two, uh, but understanding that there are two different paths for you to use. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna focus a little bit more heavily on ASHRAE 90.1, uh, along with touching on some of these differences with 2018 IECC. So those of you who may be a little bit more familiar with the IECC, uh, looking at understanding some of those differences. Part of the reason why these are differences is their development process uh, is a little bit different. The International Energy Conservation Code uh, is a code uh, that is adopted by law. And then uh, for Illinois, uh, we have adopted the IECC. Uh, and then the ASHRAE uh, 90.1 is a standard. Uh, so these standards can be used to demonstrate compliance with codes. So uh, again, these are related between codes and standards, uh, but their development process is a little bit different. Uh, again, I will uh, remind you that you need to show compliance using one or the other. Uh, you can take the most stringent of, of both and even going above and beyond. Uh, the minimum standards set forth in these codes and standards is uh, definitely uh, quite useful. Uh, but you do have to show all compliance using one path or the other. Uh, so you can't, for example, uh, have a 90.1 compliant uh, HVAC system with an IECC compliant lighting uh, and electrical system. So. Uh, that is something to, to keep in mind. So, Also understanding uh, how, as we progress forward, that each successive uh, energy code does tend to use less energy uh, for compliance. So a minimally compliant uh, 2016 building uh, as compared to a minimally compliant 2019 building uh, will save somewhere in the, the four to 5%. Uh, so not only does this help as far as reducing our energy, but also understanding that this is going to lessen the building's climate footprint uh, over time and allow uh, for good value over time. Uh, understanding that while building costs are a uh, initial construction cost is a one-time expense, uh, this is something that over time you end up, your utility bill comes every single month. Uh, so understanding that what you build today, uh, these buildings will have an impact on their surrounding environment uh, over the next, you know, hopefully 50, 75 or 100 years, uh, possibly even more than that. So uh, some of the, the larger, uh, changes that we're seeing is uh, in the fenestration uh, changing from uh, metal framed and non-metal framed and, and trying to consolidate some of these uh, along over the time. So, which simplifies uh, performance evaluation. So let's take a look at a little bit about ASHRAE 90.1 uh, and how this is organized uh, over time. With ASHRAE, uh, it's looking at, you know, uh, this is very uh, likely to be very familiar with several of you, uh, beginning with purpose and scope and, and definitions in the front of the document. Uh, it then goes into uh, the building envelope uh, in HVAC, and then your different systems, and then finally your uh, energy cost budget method. Uh, so rather than 
looking at prescriptive compliance uh, with each individual system, looking at the total building as a system and comparing the cost of the proposed building uh, as compared to the energy cost of a minimally compliant building. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, making sure that we're trying to drive down costs and understanding that these buildings are systems of systems. Uh, so allowing a, a little bit of flexibility through the energy cost uh, budget method allows you to uh, have better uh, service hot water systems, for example, uh, which may uh, allow you to uh, decrease some of the uh, requirements of your, your HVAC system. Uh, and so being able to trade some of those off. Uh, with this, uh, existing buildings are built directly into the various areas. So inside the building envelope and HVAC and service water heating, uh, it has existing buildings built directly into each of those sections. Uh, whereas if we move over to the uh, IECC, you know, it starts out very similarly with the purpose, scope, and administration and uh, definitions at the front of the uh, code and then getting into your different uh, sections, you know, your envelope and your mechanical and your service water heating. Uh, it, the IECC also does have some things that are not found in ASHRAE 90.1. Uh, such as this additional efficiency packages. Uh, the total building performance uh, is very similar to the energy uh, cost budget, which was in ASHRAE 90.1. Uh, however, IECC pulls buildings into their own chapter. Uh, so existing buildings are found in their own chapter, which then refers back into the earliest provisions uh, in chapter four. Uh, so ASHRAE 90.1, again, they're all consolidated into each uh, individual section. So envelope in existing buildings uh, and envelope for new construction are all together in ASHRAE 90.1. Whereas IECC, you have existing building envelopes in chapter four, or you have new construction building envelopes in chapter four and existing buildings uh, envelopes would be in chapter five and referring back up. So uh, there's also a separate maintenance and commissioning section in the IECC for uh, new buildings. So, as we look at just and focusing in on just the envelope uh, for ASHRAE 90.1, you know, starting with our, our general compliance paths and then mandatory provisions. So this is uh, regardless of how you're going to demonstrate compliance, these provisions are required to uh, be found in these buildings uh, regardless of that path. Uh, it then proceeds from those mandatory provisions into uh, those various paths and the requirements uh, depending on which path you're using, uh, whether that's the prescriptive path, uh, the en envelope trade-off path, energy cost budget, uh, or for those of you who may be a little bit more uh, familiar with lead projects, uh, commonly we see those using Appendix G, the performance rating system uh, for compliance. Uh, and then proceeds into submittals and products uh, and verification. So uh, again, for ASHRAE 90.1, these requirements are organized based on your compliance path rather than the specific component itself. Uh, so that's where a, a lot of the difference is going to be between ASHRAE 90.1 as compared to the IECC. Uh, IECC lays out what your compliance paths are and then goes into uh, the various components and whether those are mandatory which is required for regardless of compliance paths, or if those are just for the prescriptive uh, paths, uh, which if you are using a COM check, uh, that is likely to be a UA trade-off that may be used in the envelope, which is 
prescriptive, it is not performance. Uh, we, we do see that confusion a lot. Uh, you may notice that roof reflectance is uh, grayed out here. Uh, it is in the IECC. Uh, however, it is not uh, applicable to our climate zones uh, here in the state of Illinois. Uh, there may be local jurisdictions, such as the city of Chicago, uh, that do have local requirements for roof reflectance uh, for your flat roofs. So, uh, also with the envelope, uh, then going through the fenestration uh, and air leakage. So, again, with IECC, our compliance paths come first, and then the requirements uh, come after that. So uh, with that, I believe we have our first poll question. New. And this is, uh, ASHRAE places all envelope requirements in the envelope section, while the IECC breaks out the existing buildings and alternate compliance paths in separate sections and then refers back into the envelope section. Is this true or false? I don't see that we've got any questions in our Q&A window yet, but please, as we go through the presentation, if you do have questions pop up, please enter those into that Q&A. responses in. All right. It looks like most most people picked up that yes, this is this is true that uh, IECC breaks out existing buildings and, and compliance pat and new construction separately, uh, whereas ASHRAE groups it all together. Uh, so very good on that. All right. With that, you know, understanding that, you know, while ASHRAE and ICC uh, envelope requirements uh, are very similar to a lot of, uh, to each other, uh, there are some slight differences and particularly looking at some of the definitions uh, to understand where those are changed. So. All right. so. Do have a few definition differences that may be, uh, that will be of interest. Uh, first of which, between the 2018 and IECC and 2019 ASHRAE 90.1, there are six counties uh, that have moved to a warmer uh, climate zone four. And so for the envelope, this is likely to, to mean that there are uh, significant impact in these counties. Uh, the, just so that you are aware that the 2021 IECC map uh, mirrors the ASHRAE 90.1 2019 map. So uh, those of you today are, are seeing a preview of what is to come here in the state of Illinois. Uh, so if you do have projects here in these six counties, uh, somewhere along the, uh, between the I-70 and I-72 corridor, uh, these may have a difference in climate zone, which may lean you towards uh, ASHRAE 90.1 over IECC or vice versa. So just being aware that those are there. Another piece of this is understanding that there is some differences in what is considered indirectly conditioned space. Uh, the IECC has a, a couple of different options, uh, as does ASHRAE. And so with the IECC, where uh, we are separating uh, condition space from indirectly conditioned space by uninsulated walls, uh, understanding that with those walls being uninsulated, those are not part of the thermal boundary of a building. And so heat uh, would be able to more readily pass through that. Uh, this is very similar to ASHRAE, uh, indirectly conditioned, where the heat transfer rate uh, between the indirectly conditioned space and the conditioned space is larger than between the indirectly space 
or indirectly conditioned space and uh, heat transfer to outdoors. Uh, so those are, are very similar together. Uh, IECC also does call out, uh, you know, indirectly conditioned as if you can communicate through uh, openings with conditioned spaces. So these are uh, not openings with doors and, and things like that, uh, but these would be uh, typically openings, vents, and, and things like that. Uh, ASHRAE is a little bit more specific about this, uh, understanding that the, the air change between spaces uh, is more than three air changes per hour. So again, these are uh, more uh, unrestricted openings with that. So those are very similar. IECC goes a little bit further. And so if you have spaces that have uninsulated pipes or ductwork, that is also considered indirectly conditioned and therefore part of the conditioned space. Uh, so uh, this is a, a little bit, a little bit of a difference there. ASHRAE does not have that uh, extra little bit about uninsulated pipes and ductwork for indirectly conditioned space. So, another one is understanding what's above grade versus below grade walls. Uh, the IECC uh, delineates that is if at least 15% of the wall is above the finished grade, then that is considered an above grade wall. Uh, so the, that entire wall is considered above grade uh, for the purposes of envelope and, and insulation requirements. With ASHRAE, uh, they break it out depending on where you put the insulation. Uh, so if you have interior insulation, then the, that wall needs to be insulated to the above grade requirements. Uh, so it is considered above grade for that uh, purpose. If you have exterior or integral insulation, then they split out that wall section. And so uh, below grade needs to be needs to meet the below grade requirements, and those above the finished grade need to meet the above grade uh, requirements. So uh, as we see in the, the depiction on the left, uh, because if this wall is 90% below grade for IECC, they count that as it is below grade because not 15% is above grade, uh, whereas ASHRAE says, if this is exterior insulation, top 10% is above grade, 90% is below. Uh, whereas on the right-hand side, because we are, uh, a, we at least, we have exceeded that 15% threshold, that whole wall is above grade for IECC. Uh, again, ASHRAE splits that out a little bit more for you. So. The other one is vestibule entryways. Uh, as far as where these are uh, required. And with this, uh, IECC calls out uh, that vestibules are needed unless you fit, fit into one of these categories. Uh, not used by the public. We'll touch a little bit more on this uh, a little bit later as far as what that is. Uh, generally, you probably want to try to avoid that argument of is this a public entrance or not a public entrance? What is defined as the public? Uh, so perhaps not trying to use that exception if you can't avoid it. Uh, doors primarily for vehicles and materials. Uh, so loading doors, uh, things like that. Uh, commonly, these are overhead doors uh, in warehouse buildings and uh, similar type facilities. Uh, dwelling unit doors. Uh, you know, openings to smaller areas below 3,000 square feet, uh, revolving doors, uh, and then doors with a qualifying air curtain. Uh, this air curtain is not found in the 2016 version of ASHRAE. Uh, it was added in the 2019 version. So there is a little bit of a uh, something to be aware of depending on what version of ASHRAE you're using, whether that air curtain is uh, available for use or not uh, in that. So, and when we're discussing vestibules, something to consider is 
what is it that we're really trying to achieve with these vestibules? Uh, you know, being that we are presently in, in the heart of winter and the, the most recent uh, snowstorm that we, we've uh, had and cold weather, uh, I think this is the, the time of year that we really uh, get a, a good understanding in, of why vestibules become important uh, in really trying to control that cold air uh, from being unimpeded uh, from flowing into the, the entries of a building. So uh, with ASHRAE, uh, I do have a, a few more uh, exceptions uh, for our climate zones for uh, they, they have a little bit more of a restricted, uh, a, a different view. Uh, you may notice here that this is buildings with under a thousand square feet of conditioned areas. Uh, so these are uh, small facilities, you know, strip malls would, would be a common occurrence of this. Uh, also for uh, parking garages uh, that many of you may see, uh, elevator lobbies, uh, again, understanding that elevator is uh, going to act in a, in a way of that vestibule when you're traveling uh, from the parking deck into the building, uh, that elevator is going to provide some sort of an airlock uh, for that. Uh, ASHRAE also does not require vestibules for semi-heated spaces. Uh, Sean's going to touch a, a little bit more on semi-heated uh, because this is one of those uh, places that is found in ASHRAE 90.1 that is not in uh, the IECC. And so uh, understanding what those are uh, and what those requirements are. Uh, also, ASHRAE does have another one for areas that are under 3,000 square feet uh, and uh, separate from the main building entrance. Uh, again, your primary building entrance uh, should have a uh, vestibule unless it does fit in one of the uh, other requirements, such as a, uh, the main entrance opens onto a very small space. Uh, so, And similarly with revolving doors, they're kind of an integrated vestibule, trying to uh, control that airflow uh, and minimizing that, that unimpeded airflow into the building. Uh, so with each revolution and you know, only that air that's trapped in that revolving door makes its way between the inside and outside. Uh, here we also uh, note that uh, loading dock doors uh, also, uh, again, ASHRAE calls out doors that go into dedicated uh, mechanical spaces and things like that uh, are not primary entrances. And so, uh, here again, we're uh, looking here at this employee only entrance. Uh, that can be one of those uh, things, taking a, a closer look at it. Uh, IECC uh, uses a fairly general definition, you know, of any doorway or access used by the public. Uh, so understanding who the public is, uh, the International Building Code defines the public entrance to mean the entrance that is not a service entrance or a restricted entrance. Uh, so that may depend on, you know, do you have an entrance that is uh, key card access only all the time, uh, you know, looking at it saying, is it possible that uh, someone, you know, John Q. Public might walk up to the store and open it and, and enter the building from this uh, that may be a public entrance. Uh, so ASHRAE, again, they're, they're a little bit more specific on this. And so they even break it into uh, doorways for specific spaces are not building entrances. Uh, mentioned mechanical, electrical, uh, you know, service room doors uh, and the like. So uh, ASHRAE is a little bit more specific about this. IECC says, you know, just look at what's the definition of a public entrance. So could this be a service entrance or is this a service entrance or a restricted entrance? Then that may not be the building entrance. So uh, understanding that. 
Uh, with that, I believe we have another poll. Looking at what is the difference between the IECC and ASHRAE 90.1 definitions for above and below grade walls? Uh, is there no difference? Uh, ASHRAE defines uh, above grade walls with a, a different percentage than the IECC. The IECC defines above grade walls by percentage. ASHRAE splits the, gr splits the wall into above and below grade walls or the IECC defines above grade walls based on insulation type, ASHRAE does not. And the second question, uh, the IE 2018 IECC has more generalized requirements for building entry vestibules than 90.1, true or false? So, so we did get a, a question about uh, copies of this presentation, copies of our presentation, uh, along with archive versions. Uh, the archive copy of this presentation uh, will be posted on our website. Okay, we still got a few more responses coming in, so we'll let that run just a couple seconds longer. Got most of our responses in here. Okay. So as far as what is the difference between IECC and ASHRAE 90.1 definitions for above and below grade walls, this was a, a little bit of a, a more tr difficult one. Uh, it is that the uh, IECC defines the above grade wall based on a percentage. So again, if more than 15% is above grade, that's an above grade wall. Uh, whereas ASHRAE says above grade is above grade, below grade is below grade. Uh, so they kind of split that out. Uh, and most people did pick up that the 2018 IECC does have more generalized uh, requirements for building entry, entry vestibules than ASHRAE 90.1 does. Uh, so pretty good on that. Uh, And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Sean, to talk a little bit more about the comparing our requirements. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, so what we're going to be covering, just kind of broken out, um, is this quick summary here. Uh, the big thing is semi-heated spaces, because again, ASHRAE includes that, uh, where the IECC does not. Uh, then there's some minor differences in the envelope air leakage requirements that we'll touch on. Um, that'll be actually coming with the 2021 IECC where those are gonna be more aligned with each other. Um, then we'll look at some fenestration differences between the two uh, uh, IECC and ASHRAE. Um, we'll touch on vestibules again, uh, just because there are some specific differences there. Uh, slab on uh, grade heated slabs. Uh, specific insulation levels, we'll do a comparison uh, of the those requirements for prescriptive uh, envelope insulation. And then we'll look at the performance path uh, requirements. Uh, so semi-heated spaces. Um, for the IECC, um, if you're conditioning a space um, and it doesn't fall into um, a uh, unconditioned space definition, um, then it's a conditioned area of the envelope. Uh, so uh, unvented crawl spaces, uh, basements where you've got uninsulated ductwork and piping down there um, that are going to be radiating heat into that space. Um, even spaces that are heated only and don't have cooling, those all fall under condition space for the IECC. And so they all have to meet the full envelope insulation requirements. Uh, ASHRAE gives you a little bit more flexibility by calling some of these spaces semi-heated spaces. Uh, so if you're looking at the uh, the right-hand uh, image there, uh, you can see the difference between that IECC and ASHRAE charts. Um, if you've got uh, an unconditioned basement that's fully enclosed, um, 
the walls separating that unconditioned space from conditioned spaces can fall under the semi-heated space envelope insulation requirements because you've got some sheltering in place there where you don't have direct outdoor conditions in that unconditioned space. Um, that does not uh, qualify for a ventilated crawl space as you're looking at that image because you do have direct outdoor airflow into that space uh, for humidity control purposes. Um, and so that's a little bit of a difference there between an unconditioned but enclosed basement versus a crawl space that's ventilated um, versus uh, a fully conditioned crawl space. Um, and then again, semi-heated storage. Um, there's a specific uh, requirement there um, as far as BTUs, and we'll touch on here on the next screen, uh, as far as what qualifies a semi-heated storage space. Um, but that conditioned space there can then have a lesser amount of insulation that meets that uh, semi-heated space insulation levels. Uh, so what is a semi-heated space? Uh, for zones four and five, uh, that's defined as a space that's heated with uh, less than 15 BTUs per hour uh, per square foot. Um, and so you do have that uh, decreased R value requirements um, and there is an air barrier exception to semi-heated spaces that we'll touch on here. Um, Again, these spaces don't exist in the IECC, so it's a little bit more flexibility that ASHRAE gives designers um, in the design of their buildings uh, that the IECC does not. Uh, so that semi-heated space air barrier alignment exception. Um, semi-heated spaces uh, are not required to have a full um, air barrier around the exterior of those spaces uh, that's verified. Um, but the condition space does have to have a fully continuous air barrier around it. Um, a little bit of concern can arise here in having insulation in that semi-heated uh, spaces um, that doesn't have a proper air barrier. Does it then achieve its proper insulating value? Uh, are you getting the, the value that you need out of it? Um, and so you do have to be careful with those installations um, and designs for semi-heated spaces that you're not putting in insulation that's then going to be compromised by not having an air barrier if you do decide not to have a continuous air barrier in that space uh, per your design. Um, but something else to be aware of is the air barrier just has to be continuous around the conditioned space. That can include the semi-heated space as part of that air barrier alignment. Um, so what you're seeing here is that air barrier instead of uh, just wrapping around the condition space, extending out into the semi-heated space. Um, some, probably the most common situation for this is uh, with vestibules. Um, you do have to have the proper air uh, sealing for the exterior doors of that vestibule, um, but it can also apply to some uh, larger semi-heated areas. Um, so yes, this, this is compliant per ASHRAE for air barrier alignment. Um, but again, we do have some concerns um, with that insulation between now the conditioned space and the semi-heated uh, space. If you don't have a full air barrier there, are you gonna have proper humidity control when you're in the cooling season? Um, and so certain things to, to, to be aware of uh, that while this is compliant, there are other considerations to take in as well. And we do recommend that if you're going to be installing insulation that you do have uh, an air barrier aligned with that insulation to ensure you're getting the full effectiveness out of it. Uh, the next thing to touch on is the envelope air leakage testing requirements. Uh, for the IECC in the 2018 version, it is one option for compliance to do pressure testing for your buildings to verify the uh, continuity of the air barrier. Um, and for that testing, um, the requirement is that 40 C, uh, 0.4 CFM per square foot of envelope area. Um, in ASHRAE, the testing is a mandatory provision. Um, and so specific areas of the buildings have to be tested, um, listed here. Um, any area under uh, the roof needs to be tested. Again, uh, you're kind of checking with these um, major areas where you uh, are commonly going to see uh, discontinuities in the air barrier. Um, so that 
when you're checking under the roof, you're checking that connection between the wall and the roof uh, to make sure that that's been properly uh, attached. Um, building entrances, making sure that those are properly installed, um, typically can be areas of larger air leakage. Um, and then for the rest of the building, it's a 25% sample of the enclosure area. Um, and so uh, you could set up a pressure test in a certain zone of the building and do a sampling through the building that meets that 25% of the above grade exterior wall area. Um, and then we do see that in the 2021 IECC that these uh, testing requirements are also uh, extending to the IECC incoming uh, versions. Uh, so be aware of that, uh, that those are coming uh, and will be mandatory. Um, ASHRAE does have an exception. Um, for air leakage testing. Uh, if you don't quite meet that 0.4 CFM per square foot of envelope area requirement, you fall between 0.4 and 0.6. ASHRAE does allow you to do uh, corrective work for that insulation, uh, but that work doesn't have to then be tested again and verify that you're now below that 0.4 CFM per square foot. Um, ways to find um, where those leaks are at, um, smoke testing, infrared imaging, visual inspections. Um, but the key thing here is only non-destructive remediation of any found air leaks is required. Uh, so something to be aware of is that you're gonna wanna do pressure testing for your building envelope as early as you can in your design process so that you can catch these things um, in the, the air barrier testing and correct any issues that are found. Um, so generally, once you've got your your exterior envelope completed, you've got your windows installed, but before you've done uh, most of the insulating work, if you're doing fibrous insulation um, and you've got drywall in place on the interior, you might want to do uh, some uh, envelope air barrier verification at that stage uh, so that you can find these issues if you don't quite meet the, uh, the air leakage requirement. Um, again, this will be added in the 2021 IECC, so you'll see this coming, uh, but for the 2018 version, um, this exception is not included. You have to meet that 0.4 CFM per square foot of envelope area. Um, moving on to other uh, compliance options, uh, in the IECC, you can comply by uh, installing materials or assemblies, um, that meet air leakage testing um, uh, tests in a lab um, and then are installed on your site um, and properly connected to each other. You do have to document in your plan drawings that joints between assemblies have proper air seals that aren't going to dislodge over time. Um, however, independent verification on site of those um, joints between those assemblies, that those assemblies are properly installed, uh, is not required for the IECC in the 2018 version. Um, for the ASHRAE 2019 version, uh, you can have a third party um, do verification and, and periodic installation uh, inspections during construction uh, as an alternative to the pressure testing compliance. Um, So you must test all envelope areas within the floor space directly uh, below the roof, uh, exterior doorways, uh, an additional 25% of the above grade walls with pressure testing. Um, and so uh, the thing to note here is that this exception doesn't uh, get you out of uh, that mandatory pressure testing for the envelope. Um, it's uh, a way to do a design review process ahead of that pressure testing to, to ensure that your, your envelope is going to be properly air sealed. Uh, and so digging into that verification, it's part of the ASHRAE only uh, compliance path. Uh, you have a consultant come out or an independent reviewer or uh, maybe a code official. Um, They'll come out, complete, and approve a design review of the air barrier compliance in your plan drawings. 
Uh, they'll do periodic field inspections uh, for the, uh, the proper installation of those materials. And then they'll produce a report that says that uh, this envelope is going to be airtight and that will meet uh, those compliance requirements uh, rather than having to do the pressure testing. Uh, and again, the main thing we're, we're targeting here is uh, ensuring compliance with that air barrier requirement because it's very important for maintaining the integrity of the building, uh, controlling drafts within the building, condensation, um, and uh, long-term integrity of those materials. Looking at the fenestration projection factors, uh, this is the, another slight difference between the IACC and ASHRAE. Uh, if you're looking at the fenestration tables in the IACC, um, they have specific solar heat gain coefficients based on your climate zone, the orientation of those windows, and the projection factor above those windows for any overhangs. Um, in the 2021 IACC, they're updating uh, those solar heat gain coefficients, instead of being based on uh, orientation, climate zone, and projection factor, uh, they're going to be based on whether those windows are operable or inoperable um, as far as how that solar heat gain coefficient gets changed by the projection factor. Uh, in ASHRAE, though, uh, they have a little bit more flexibility in how you select your solar heat gain coefficient for windows based on um, how that uh, uh, projection is shading the window and how you calculate that projection factor. Uh, one thing to note is that in the 2019 ASHRAE 90.1 uh, exceptions for solar heat gain coefficient, uh, north facing windows can be calculated separately from other uh, uh, solar heat gain coefficients. Um, so while the IACC lists specific slightly higher solar heat gain coefficients for north facing glass, um, because you don't have south facing sun adding heat to the building, you've just mainly got losses there. Um, you don't need to be as concerned with the solar heat gain coefficient on the north facing side of the building. Um, ASHRAE allows uh, calculation of uh, that required solar heat gain coefficient based on an area weighted average. Uh, of an uncorrected solar heat gain coefficient from the windows in other orientations. Uh, so you can do a bit of a trade-off in ASHRAE where at IECC has a specific requirement there. Uh, so looking at the projection factor itself in the IECC, it's just the extension of the shading uh, component above the window versus the, the divided by the height of that component above the base of the window sill. Um, and that's your projection factor. Um, again, IECC has specific solar heat gain requirements tied to uh, this calculated projection factor, um, but they don't account for transparency or fins or, or different types of shading in that shading device itself. Um, and this simplifies the analysis, but it can lead to uh, some lower performing window shading devices being accepted by the IECC. Uh, when we get to ASHRAE, what we see is that ASHRAE calculates your shading factor based on the elements in that shading device and then adjusts the uh, projection factor based on how much shade you get out of that device. Uh, so you'll have uh, the area of the infill, which is uh, the interior part of that shading device. It could be fins, it could be tinted glazing, uh, it could be uh, a mesh material. Um, and so you'll have a percent opacity of that material that's multiplied by that area. And then you've got the solid framing that's supporting uh, that material multiplied by the area of that framing. Um, that gives you an adjustment factor uh, that gets multiplied by the projection factor to give you an adjusted projection factor. Um, so ASHRAE does add this consideration uh, for the shading device opacity um, that gives you a little bit more flexibility with your shading devices. Um, and because you're, um, solar heat gain coefficient is related to a range of projection factors uh, and not a, a specific designated uh, solar heat gain coefficient, um, you've got a lot more flexibility with the window uh, specifications in ASHRAE than you do with IECC. Um, for shades with slats in them, there is a specific note to be aware of. Um, 
that those slats opacity is measured at a particular time of year, and that's uh, when the sun is um, at solar noon on the summer solstice. Um, that's when the opacity of those slat uh, shading devices is measured. Um, so usually a, a computer program will do that kind of measurement for you. Um, but with other devices, a mesh fill or a tinted window, um, then it's just a percent transparency for that infill area. Um, looking at the wall area um, and how that impacts uh, fenestration ratios, uh, for the IECC, the uh, wall area is the total um, wall area that is above grade only. Uh, for ASHRAE, um, the below grade portion of the walls is included in that. Um, where this impacts you is your window to wall ratio calculations. Um, so if uh, looking at the example on the screen here, if you have a partially earth sheltered building um, and you're look, targeting that 40% window to wall ratio in ASHRAE, uh, you've got a bit more wall area that's being considered um, than there is in the IECC. Uh, so if you're looking at the IECC example there, um, without uh, the exceptions, uh, the baseline window to wall ratio is at 30% of the above grade wall only. You've got, uh, in this particular example, about 25% less wall area, uh, where with ASHRAE, you've got about 25% more wall area. You can put more area of fenestration in that assembly. Um, so looking at the window to wall ratio uh, in detail here, uh, the IECC has a maximum 30% window to wall ratio, except under special conditions uh, where you can go up to 40% if you've got daylighting controls and some additional requirements. Um, ASHRAE in their uh, individual prescriptive tables for insulation values list for each uh, climate zone what the maximum window to wall ratio is. For our climate zones four and five, it's 40%. Um, they do have a specific exception uh, uh, as an allowance for um, kind of retail entities, um, where if you've got street facing street level fenestration, up to 75% of that street facing wall um, can be uh, fenestration, given that that wall is less than 20 foot uh, in height and there is a continuous overhang over that wall providing shading. Um, so um, again, ASHRAE can let you get away since it's including more wall area in that initial calculation uh, with a little bit more fenestration area when following these prescriptive measures than the IECC. Um, and they do have, uh, again, an area specific exception that the IECC does not that gives you, again, a little bit more flexibility for retail type spaces or um, uh, buildings that are going to have displays through fenestration uh, that, again, the IECC does not have. Uh, so a little bit more flexibility on the ASHRAE side. Um, looking at the specific fenestration requirements, the big difference between ASHRAE 2016 and 2019 is a jump in window performance. So you can see highlighted in green here. Uh, where the performance becomes a little stronger uh, in the 2019 version than in the uh, 2016 version. Um, something else to note here um, is that in the IECC, um, you're looking at different orientations of the windows. Um, that's going to be moving more in line with what we're seeing here for the 2019 ASHRAE, where it's a fixed or an operable window instead of the window's orientation. Um, and so these tables will be a little bit more aligned with each other between the uh, ASHRAE and the IECC in the future. Um, looking at the 2018 IECC, um, you've got um, a little bit of difference in how they're organized. Uh, since the framing material is not a determining factor uh, for your U values and uh, solar heat gain coefficient, uh, 2019 ASHRAE is a little bit more in conformance with the IECC now, um, where again, we're looking at is that window fixed or operable um, versus looking at uh, only the orientation and the uh, projection factor. 
Uh, so the IACC breaks down that solar heat gain co coefficient performance uh, in their initial requirements. ASHRAE takes that orientation and projection factor into consideration later. There's a little calculation that they do um, where uh, you've got a, for uh, every uh, tenth of a change in your solar heat gain coefficient, you've got a different, uh, uh, sorry, uh, projection factor. You've got a different um, solar heat gain coefficient that's attributed to that as your baseline coefficient. Uh, where again, ASHRAE has these specific ranges. Um, if your projection factor is less than 0.2 and you're in this specific orientation, you have to meet this specific solar heat gain coefficient. Um, if you're greater than uh, that 0.2, you've got a different uh, coefficient. So there's uh, a large range for the IECC. There's only three ranges for the projection factor, uh, where ASHRAE has got a range of 10 different points. Uh, so again, a little more flexibility with ASHRAE in selecting window performance based on that uh, projection factor adjustment uh, where the IECC does not. Uh, looking at skylight area requirements, uh, there's a slight difference here um, in what IECC does for uh, calculating the uh, affected uh, skylight area than in ASHRAE. Uh, in the IECC, uh, the allowance is for 25% of the ceiling height to be under 15 feet to trigger skylight requirements, uh, where you have to have skylights for daylighting into a space. Uh, in ASHRAE, 100% of the ceiling height must be 15 feet to trigger requirements in that space. Um, so you don't have that uh, allowance that the IECC does for a little bit uh, lower window area. And so again, ASHRAE might be a little less stringent on the skylight requirements uh, than the IECC due to that. Um, ASHRAE does not have a lighting power density exception uh, for uh, the mandatory inclusion of skylights, um, where the IECC does. Uh, if your lighting power density is less than um, half a watt per square foot, uh, then the skylighting is not mandatory to offset uh, the electric lighting in the building. Um, there is no exception for interior shading in the IECC, where the ASHRAE uh, does have an exception uh, where 90% of the skylight area is shaded on the summer solstice at noon by a permanent architectural feature. Uh, this could be ramps, it could be a, a, a cosmetic feature in, the, in a skylit area. Uh, if it's providing that shading and offsetting those heating needs, um, then uh, the skylight requirements are, are slightly different, uh, where the IECC doesn't have that exception. Um, in the IECC, there are no solar heat gain coefficient exceptions for skylights, uh, where uh, ASHRAE does have an exception. Um, if we dig into this a little bit in, in more detail, um, the ASHRAE exceptions are somewhat touched on by the IECC, but not as stringently. Um, so if you're looking at the ASHRAE column there, there's an exception for solar heat gain coefficient uh, minimum values. Uh, if skylights have a 90% haze uh, factor, uh, in the IECC, you can see that there is a uh, skylight requirement um, to have that 90% haze factor unless they're designed to exclude uh, direct sunlight. Um, and so uh, they're partially aligned here um, in that uh, IECC gives you a little bit more flexibility than ASHRAE. ASHRAE specifies um, that that haze factor must be in place. IECC gives you a little bit more flexibility in that um, as long as there isn't direct sunlight coming in through that skylight. Uh, that haze factor isn't necessary uh, for a, a solar heat gain coefficient exception. Um, ASHRAE adds a few more things onto that though. Uh, the visible transmittance of the skylight must be greater than 0.4. Uh, again, you're wanting that daylight into the building um, without the, the added heat coming in. Um, and then lighting has to be controlled by photo controls in a daylit zone. Um, where the IECC doesn't have those two exceptions uh, to allow an increase in the solar heat gain coefficient of the skylights. Uh, 
digging into the vestibule entryways again, uh, we wanted to highlight uh, that more specific exception uh, as Ryan covered earlier. Uh, for the IECC, you've got an exception for spaces less than 3,000 square foot. Uh, a smaller area uh, doesn't necessarily need a vestibule like a large uh, entryway foyer. Um, the ASHRAE does include that additional text that it has to be separate from the building entrance. Uh, so if it's the primary building entrance, but it's a, a smaller vestibule, uh, uh, foyer behind that vestibule, um, ASHRAE does still require uh, a vestibule entryway on that, uh, that opening. Um, and so you can get a little bit more stringent uh, with the ASHRAE requirement there. Uh, depending on uh, if that's a primary building entrance or if it's a, a secondary entrance, staff entrance, restricted entrance. Uh, as Ryan covered earlier, it's that uh, IECC relying on that more generalized public entrance definition uh, where ASHRAE is a little more specific. Um, another place where the vestibule entryway requirements are significantly different is that the IECC again relies on a generalized uh, requirement that the outer doors and inner doors should be spaced so that they cannot open at the same time as a, a, an occupant walks through them. Again, the target there is to break that draft of outside air coming into the building. Um, ASHRAE um, puts specific numbers to what that spacing needs to be. Uh, and so it's a little more strict with the vestibule requirements than the IECC. Uh, so for spaces, um, of 40,000 square feet or more, uh, that spacing needs to be 16 feet between the exterior doors and the interior doors, um, allowing for a greater amount of traffic. Um, if it's a smaller space than that, less expected traffic, um, you would expect a, a little less uh, distance. Uh, they allow seven foot uh, spacing between those doors. Um, again, trying to target a distance that allows the exterior to open, close behind the occupant, and then the interior to open as they walk through. Um, again, since ASHRAE has semi-heated spaces that the IECC does not, they do have specific requirements around that for vestibules, that the thermal envelope of the unconditioned vestibule must comply with the semi-heated space requirements. Um, and so the U factor on the outside of that glass uh, must meet the semi-heated space requirements. The solar heat gain coefficient must meet the semi-heated space requirements. Um, and then also your air barrier must extend in continuity out to the outside of the vestibule. It cannot be on the inside layer of that vestibule. Again, if you're, you're trying to block that flow of outside air into the space and you don't have a good air barrier on the outside of the vestibule, is it really going to stop that draft? Um, and so again, it's targeting that purpose. What's the design intent? Um, Next, looking at foundation insulation, specifically heated slabs. For the IECC, um, if you have a heated slab on grade, it requires R5 insulation under the entire slab uh, and has some increased uh, perimeter insulation requirement up to R15 from R10. Um, the perimeter insulation is allowed in a footnote to the table to stop at the bottom of the heated slab. It doesn't need to extend below that. Um, but this does add a, a little bit of confusion because the table has a stated depth uh, for a heated slab insulation, but then has a footnote that says you don't need to go that deep. Um, the main thing here is the slab is fully wrapped by insulation, so you don't need to extend insulation down further. It's not going to provide you much benefit. Um, in ASHRAE, though, uh, they've kept it relatively simple. They've got even more insulation on the perimeter, and you just have to hit that perimeter insulation down to the target depth. Uh, so it avoids that confusion that gets introduced by the IECC. Um, but what we will note here is that um, if you don't have that continuous insulation under the heated slab, in certain conditions that can actually be a performance detriment uh, for the ASHRAE uh, code than the IECC. Um, if you're uh, on a loamy type soil, it's sandy, light gravel, um, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of heat transfer from that heated slab. Once the initial ground material there is, is warmed up, you're not going to have a whole lot of heat transfer down into the soils, um, which is what ASHRAE is banking on. You're preventing that leaching of, of heat out around the perimeter up to the uh, that frost line of the soil. 
uh, where you have greater heat transfer. And it's banking on that, that constant heat uh, under the slab being trapped there by the perimeter insulation. However, if your slab is uh, directly connected to bedrock, uh, heavy clays, or a high groundwater table, um, not having that it, continuous insulation under the slab will allow a lot of heat to be carried away uh, and can be a performance detriment to, in that situation. Um, and so we do uh, kind of like the, prefer the IECC insulation requirement under a heated slab as it does provide that thermal break. Um, but you do have that trade off in ASHRAE where economically it may be a little bit easier um, to uh, dig a trench uh, and put in vertical insulation only rather than um, insulating under the entirety of the slab. Um, so uh, something to look at there is a, an economic trade-off for your project. Um, where does that balance out for your, for your design? Um, directly comparing the uh, prescriptive requirements for insulation here, uh, we've highlighted in yellow the semi-heated space requirements for ASHRAE. Uh, because they aren't in the IECC, um, there isn't really a direct comparison there. Um, but if you're seeing uh, green on here, uh, then the ASHRAE requirements are more stringent than the 2018 IECC. Uh, as we move to the 2021 IECC, these should be more in line with each other uh, and fairly comparable. Um, and we'll do that comparison in the future. Um, but as you can see here, um, a little bit more strict uh, in the non-residential uh, roofing insulation requirements uh, for attic spaces. Uh, the IECC has that R38 requirement where uh, ASHRAE has gone up to that R49. Uh, metal building requirements. Um, ASHRAE is allowing a little more uh, continuous insulation here, uh, requiring more continuous insulation, uh, where the IECC is allowing a bit more cavity insulation, a little less continuous. Um, so it's a, a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, usually that continuous insulation is going to provide better performance than a blend of continuous and cavity insulation uh, because you're breaking that thermal break to those metal structural beams. Um, and so we, we credit the ASHRAE there as being a little more uh, strict uh, than the IECC. Same thing for metal frame buildings. Um, they've got more continuous insulation um, uh, required uh, and similarly for wood frame buildings as well. Uh, where IECC allows uh, no continuous insulation if you've got an R20 cavity. Um, the ASHRAE is saying you still need uh, an R5 continuous, uh, but the cavity is an R19 requirement. Um, and this is kind of accounting for a bit of, uh, if you put an R20 um, bat into a wall assembly, it gets compressed and the effective R value is diminished slightly. Um, and I believe that ASHRAE is compensating for that with, with this um, continued requirement for an R5 continuous insulation and noting that R19 cavity insulation, accounting for that compression a little bit. Um, here, uh, you can see a bit more of a mix. Um, ASHRAE is a little less stringent uh, for the slab on grade floor requirements as we've already covered. Um, it also follows for the unheated slabs. Uh, they're a little less stringent. Um, you hit that insulation to depth uh, uh, below grade. Actually, the unheated is colored wrong. It should be more stringent. Um, ASHRAE is requiring an R15 where the IECC is requiring R10. Um, sorry for that miscoloring there. Um, for uh, floors, if you've got a mass floor, again, ASHRAE is a little more stringent uh, for that insulation requirement under that floor, separating it from um, outdoor environment. Um, an additional 4.6 to 6.7 uh, uh, continuous insulation required there. Um, and for uh, doors, um, ASHRAE has got a little bit less stringent requirement. If you do the conversion from R value to uh, U factor, uh, the IECC is at uh, about a 0.21 U factor, uh, which is a little bit more stringent than the, the U factor of 0.31 uh, 
that's in the ASHRAE requirements. Um, but again, that big difference here uh, is for the heated slabs or ASHRAE um, that can be uh, a little bit of a detriment not having that continuous insulation under the entire slab, depending on your soil conditions. Uh, roof insulation, looking at that, uh, the ICC has exceptions that allow uh, for averaging the U factor to compensate for tapered insulation. Um, and so uh, you can have uh, insulation vary within an inch from minimum to maximum in the IECC, uh, where you can then average the U factor of that across your, your roof area. Uh, where the ASHRAE does not have this exception. Uh, you have to meet the minimum everywhere on the roof um, unless you're doing a UA trade-off um, for compliance. Uh, per the user manual here, a little bit of clarification for ASHRAE. Each assembly is required to have the specified minimum R value of insulation throughout the assembly, uh, including roofs with tapered insulation. Uh, so you cannot average the R value like you can with the IECC. Uh, but we do note that IECC, um, you are limited to a one inch variance. Uh, they still want to maintain uh, more continuity uh, in the insulation levels across the roof. Um, and then uh, looking at the performance path, specifically the requirements in the performance path for envelope uh, modeling requirements. Um, the only major difference here is in modeling um, the baseline uh, air leakage for a building. Uh, for the IECC, uh, that baseline air leakage is not specified, uh, nor is it in the proposed model. Um, and so we would expect that as those are modeled, they're modeled the same to each other. You're not, they're not traded off. Um, but there is a, in the text outside the tables for the performance path in the ICC, um, a specification in C407 um, that the values shall be from an approved source uh, for that air leakage rate. So this could be your air leakage testing. Uh, it could be um, if you did the assembly uh, method, um, typical uh, air leakage values. Um, and so that's where you're getting those from in the ICC. Uh, in the ASHRAE, uh, performance path. Um, the reference model air leakage is specified at one CFM per square foot of envelope area. Um, and then the proposed model shall have your tested rate. And since testing is required, um, for most instances, unless you're following that exception, um, you're going to have a value to enter there. Um, if you're um, Using the exception uh, where you've got third-party verification of your envelope assembly uh, through the construction process, um, you can enter in an, an approximate um, CFM per square foot. And that's generally going to be based on um, the tested air leakage of those assemblies kind of averaged across the envelope area. Uh, and so other than that, um, the installation modeling for the envelope for the performance path is very similar between these, these two paths, uh, IECC and ASHRAE. Um, so it was a long section. We're going to take a quick break here for a, uh, a poll, make sure we covered everything in detail. Uh, we'll go over the questions that have come in as well. Um, but which of the following is not true about semi-heated spaces? Uh, fully enclosed conditioned rooms can use semi-heated space insulation requirements. Semi-heated spaces do not require any air barrier in climate zone zero through six. Semi-heated spaces include rooms that are heated only, but not cooled. Semi-heated spaces, uh, air leakage can be tested separately from conditioned spaces or all of the above. Um, are none of those true? And then uh, our second question for heated slabs, ASHRAE 90.1 excludes under slab insulation and the IECC requires it. Why might that be? Um, a detriment to the 90.1 requirement. Uh, it doesn't. ASHRAE requires more pruner insulation to balance. Uh, ASHRAE's heated slab isn't decoupled from the ground, which can, can cause delayed heating response and uh, heat loss down into the soil. Uh, perimeter only insulation is harder to detail properly, resulting in more exceptions by code officials. Uh, the IECC performance is actually worse since perimeter insulation stops at the bottom of the slab. Um, so think back to our discussion on the slabs there. 
Uh, and then our third question is, which is included in ASHRAE performance path but is excluded from the IECC? Um, specific baseline air leakage, equipment efficiency, unregulated energy use, or uh, fenestration, uh, solar heat gain coefficient changes. Um, so some questions that came in. Uh, do buildings that are replacing the existing windows, uh, are they required to do pressure testing? Um, for existing buildings in the IECC, pressure testing is not required. Um, and I'm trying to recall for the 2021 if that's still the case. Um, usually existing buildings are grandfathered in with their existing air leakage. You just can't make it worse uh, with updates. Um, but testing is generally not required for them. Uh, Ryan, do you have an update? Yeah, that, that's correct. The, the testing is for new construction only. Uh, existing buildings uh, and additions are, are not required to be tested. Uh, however, uh, they may require uh, for additions to have uh, building envelope commissioning, uh, which would be uh, design review and uh, field verification of uh, proper installation. But you wouldn't actually test the building. Um, should the testing of the exterior envelope be discussed with the owner or not? Uh, it does add cost. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, particularly in the IECC where it's not mandatory yet. Um, but as we're moving towards that in the future, if you've got projects that are uh, kind of in the planning stages, uh, it's certainly a good thing to discuss with the owner. There will be some added cost. Um, but it's important to note for the building owner that they're going to be insured of a quality product through that testing. Um, and that will probably help alleviate their concerns about that added cost is that it's, it's going to, in the long run, save them some energy costs as well right. and will pay for itself. It, it, will, it will also likely lead to uh, substantially improved comfort too, because uh, really what, what we're doing is, you know, verifying that the, the envelope, you know, that the envelope is as good as they paid for it to be. Uh, and then the last question is, who is to enforce the testing? Many times architects are not a part of the construction process and the client only uses the architect up to the point of obtaining a permit. Um, so uh, the authority having jurisdiction, your code official is, is going to require um, that uh, pressure testing report be delivered to him as far as who organizes that uh, and ensures that it's done. Um, the construction manager, um, the architect's going to need to coordinate that with the, with the construction group as part of that design process. Um, but the, the construction manager on site is probably going to be the one that has to actually ensure that that testing is done on site. Okay, looks like we've got most of our poll responses in and share those results real quick. Um, our first question, um, let's see. Which is not true, fully enclosed, be used. Um, the first option there um, is a little bit tricky. Um, Fully enclosed spaces um, cannot use the semi-heated space insulation requirements. It's the spaces between conditioned space and those unconditioned rooms. Um, they are not required to have air barriers in climate zone zero through six. That is um, correct. Um, semi-heated space uh, rooms uh, are heated only but are not cooled. That's also correct. Um, Semi-heated space air leakage can be tested separately from conditioned spaces. I didn't cover that in our uh, lecture notes, and I apologize for that, uh, but that's also correct. So the first one is uh, the correct answer there, um, although it's a little bit uh, confusing probably because um, while the unconditioned room um, cannot use the semi-heated space insulation requirements, uh, the insulation between that unconditioned room and the condition space can. Um, and so that's really the, the clarifying point we wanted to make there. Um, 
So the first option there is the correct answer. The rest of those are true of semi-heated spaces. Um, they do not require an air barrier except between the uh, condition space to make sure that that condition space is uh, air barrier is, is um, complete. Um, semi-heated spaces can be heated only um, and not cooled um, up to that 15 BTU per square foot. Uh, and they, they can be uh, tested separately from the condition space and then uh, that air leakage worked in if the uh, air leakage envelope goes around the outside of that um, semi-heated space. Uh, for our second question, uh, looks like most people got this correct. Um, the first option um, is kind of what uh, I think the designers lean towards, um, but uh, the ASHRAE slab isn't decoupled from the ground. So in certain specific situations, like con direct connection of the, the slab to bedrock, uh, high water table, uh, dense clay soils, um, you've got good connection for that heat to escape into the ground, which will cause delayed heating responses uh, if that heat is uh, cycling on and off uh, and can increase energy use. So the second option there is the correct answer. Uh, looks like most of you got that. Um, although the first answer, I, I guess we'll take that one too, is that it's kind of the intent um, is that there isn't uh, much difference they are supposed to balance out. Uh, and then for our third question, which is included in the ASHRAE performance path, but excluded from the IECC, um, looks like most people got this one. It is that specific baseline air leakage rate uh, that ASHRAE has that IECC doesn't have an air leakage rate specified. Uh, it just notes that it has to be an approved source doesn't know what it needs to be. Okay. So the last thing we'll touch on here are, are the, the major differences between uh, ASHRAE and ICC for existing buildings. Um, the big difference here is that um, ASHRAE seems to be a little bit more lenient in the application of the code for additions, uh, where IECC specifically requires prescriptive compliance uh, for additions to buildings. Um, ASHRAE also allows a bit of modification to the existing building to improve its performance to ease compliance for additions, um, where IECC allows additions to be um, considered along with the existing building for compliance, um, but modifying the existing building would then fall into um, alterations of that existing building not necessarily the addition component of the building. Um, and so um, that particular ASHRAE uh, allowance isn't in the IECC for additions. Um, so just as an example, uh, you could reduce window area on the existing building to increase the area in the addition uh, as a trade-off. Uh, the only caveat is that the existing building plus the addition modifications can't exceed the energy consumption. Uh, of the a building plus a fully compliant addition by itself. Uh, so if you built an addition on, modeled it, showed that um, if it's fully compliant, it has this amount of X amount of energy consumption, and then you model what you've actually installed on the building or plan to install, it just needs to be less energy um, for the ASHRAE compliance. Um, so IECC, a little more strict, you've got to have the specific uh, prescriptive compliance for the addition. Um, the only time it allows really that performance trade off is if you're considering uh, the building as a whole and not the addition in isolation. Uh, for alterations, uh, looking at those existing building exceptions are spelled out in detail. Uh, in a separate section here for the ICC, you've got chapter five. Um, that has all the existing building exceptions. Um, and there are various notes to achieving maximum possible compliance um, given the existing constraints of the building. So there's a couple of bits of text in the alteration sections um, that uh, it's usually what we commonly refer back to those points when people ask us questions about roofing insulation and things like that. Um, you cannot install something that's going to uh, degrade the safety of an existing assembly or overload it. Um, and the performance can't be worse than the existing assembly. Um, and so um, when you're looking at um, 
for IECC compliance with existing building alterations. Um, as long as you're installing the maximum insulation level that you can in that given assembly, um, that's going to be compliant with the code. Um, ASHRAE um, deals with these a little bit differently. Um, in organization, as Ryan covered at the start, they're included in uh, the specific envelope section um, instead of being a separate uh, component uh, of the code like the ICC. Uh, this can make referring uh, back and forth between uh, requirements a little bit easier um, as you're already in the envelope section for ASHRAE where ICC you're flipping back and forth between pages. Um, but ASHRAE does note specific cases where meeting installation requirements are accepted and there's not really any other language that allows uh, additional flexibility within existing constraints like there is with the IECC. Um, you have to dig a little bit deeper in the, the ASHRAE uh, language. Uh, so it does seem, again, to be a little more strict uh, in its requirements than the IECC. Um, and as far as the ex, uh, specific wording of the exceptions, um, we've highlighted in red here where ASHRAE has some additional requirements uh, that aren't included in the IECC. Um, so for storm windows, that's the same between them both. Um, you don't need to meet the prescriptive requirements uh, with that added storm window as far as solar heat gain and things like that um, if you're covering an existing window, uh, provided that the existing window has low E coding um, <clears throat> or the storm window has a low E coding. Um, Existing wall, floor, and roof cavities must be filled. Um, ASHRAE tacks onto this that that insulation must be at least an R3 prints insulation at minimum. Um, so you can't use a, uh, a less um, insulative insulation there. Um, existing assemblies without cavities where no new cavities are formed aren't required to have cavities furred onto them or additional insulation added. Again, provided that you're not increasing the energy um, by modifying the wall. So like if you remove uh, plaster from a brick wall, um, you would have to go back with some kind of drywall or something like that to maintain the same relative R value of the assembly. Uh, roof recovering uh, is included in both of those where you're just laying a new membrane on top of the existing membrane. Um, For the replacement of a roof membrane where the insulation is integral or below the existing roof deck, that's that's added in uh, to ASHRAE that's not in the IECC. Um, <clears throat> so where you've got insulation like SIPS panels or something like that, where the insulation is integral uh, to that roof assembly um, or that insulation is underneath the roof deck uh, in, on the interior of that assembly. Um, you're not then required to increase that insulation level. Um, replacement of doors is the same between uh, ASHRAE and IECC. Uh, and then ASHRAE adds in again uh, an additional exception here replacement of existing fenestration, uh, provided uh, the project is less than 25% of the existing total fenestration area. Uh, and the U factor and solar heat gain coefficient are at least equal to the previous. Um, so if you're replacing just a couple of windows on a building, um, they don't need to meet the prescriptive requirements of the code, um, provided that those replacement windows are equal to the um, performance of the existing windows. Um, but again, um, the, the ASHRAE language in the uh, existing building sections doesn't really have the that language uh, that we typically use in the IACC that says you don't need to do um, additional work um, to install insulation, uh, but it's there. Uh, it's just uh, harder to reference. Um, for repairs, um, again, IACC has a separate section for this uh, where ASHRAE are detailed specifically in those sections uh, for the insulation uh, of the envelope. Um, uh, window glazing can be replaced in an existing sash and frame. Um, that's also um, in the alteration section of the uh, ASHRAE portion of the uh, code. Um, so it's the same as the IEC section, just located in a different place. Um, and it's a similar case for uh, replacing existing doors. Um, ASHRAE includes those in alterations for the building, not as a separate repair section. Um, 
And so that's that's the main difference for that. Um, and so we have one final poll here that we will launch. Uh, for existing buildings, ASHRAE has generally stricter compliance requirements for existing buildings than the IECC. Is that true or false? Uh, and a couple more questions have come in. Um, our presentation slides are available to attendees after uh, this presentation. They'll be uploaded to our website. Uh, you can find them there along with a recording of our presentation. Uh, and then approved sources. Um, what, is, uh, what does that entail for the, the infiltration reference uh, for the performance path? Um, so uh, generally um, that would be coming from, uh, you could either do a, a report based on uh, the individual assemblies and what their air leakage rate is. You assemble those together um, and do a kind of an area weighted average of what that expected uh, air leakage rate would be for the entire facility. Um, that could be an approved source. Um, there's also some research studies that have been done on, on what existing buildings uh, air tightness are uh, and new code efficient buildings research are. I expect that that would be uh, an acceptable source uh, for what uh, your baseline infiltration rate is. Um, Ryan, are you aware of any other sources? Uh, the main thing there is whether it's gonna be acceptable to your code official or not. Yeah, that was, that was what I was going to point to was definition of approved is, you know, involve your code official. Uh, if, if it's acceptable to them, then it's approved. You know, I, I think that may also be why they're, they're moving towards this requirement of, of testing and verification is, you know, it's, it's good to pass when it's in a lab, but when you install it in a building, does it still perform? Okay, got our results in for our last poll here. Um, a little bit divided, um, but we do feel that uh, ASHRAE generally is a little bit more strict with its requirements uh, than the IECC. Uh, they do have more specific exceptions uh, than the IECC does and a couple additional exceptions, um, but because they lay out specific um, detailed requirements for those, uh, we feel that's a bit more strict than the IECC is with its uh, existing building alteration requirements. We do have another question. Why does ResCheck require 2018 to be web-based? Um, ResCheck and ComCheck both, um, while they will continue to offer their desktop versions, um, future code iterations, they're moving towards the web-based uh, application. Uh, one, it's a little bit easier to do updates on the web-based application to main, uh, keep up to date with current codes. Um, two, uh, it's easier to maintain one software package than it is the desktop versions and the web-based version. Um, so, uh, and they're also looking towards those web-based versions for easier sharing of files between uh, groups and entities involved in a project. Um, so it's it's been on their their plans uh, for a while now that they're going to be phasing towards web-based for both ResCheck and ComCheck. Uh, and so while desktop versions will continue to be um, uh, offered, uh, they will not be updated with newer code versions. Uh, those will have to be found on the web-based only. Okay, seeing no further questions coming into the chat or the q and I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, we've gone a little bit over here answering your questions, but uh, we appreciate you sticking with us. Uh, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>